Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Bhas Bapat. I work at the Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, Pune. I and my colleague Saurabh Dubey will be talking to you today about careers and opportunities in science. Uh, let me begin by first making a few disclaimers. I think it is important to uh, set some things right. Uh, so the first point is that this webinar, which is being live streamed on NPTEL YouTube, is not really an advertisement for any organization, much less an organization uh, and advertisement for, for my own organization. Uh, it is uh, also not really an information brochure okay, because there is a lot of information around us and it is just not possible to put this information out in a very short talk uh, accurately. And frankly, uh, websites are far more uh, useful for this purpose. Uh, last but not the least, this is also not a step-by-step -step manual towards a career in science. Uh, a career in science, as you will see, is a very long haul and uh, there are no set recipes for that. So please do not expect that at the end of this 40-minute session, uh, you will have a very clear picture of what you should do in order to become a scientist. Uh, now, in this talk, I have uh, used many, many images uh, just to make the talk interesting and put and add a little bit of color to a, an otherwise fairly drab uh, topic. And uh, I borrowed very heavily from the internet and I really thank heartily everyone who put out these graphics for others to use. Okay, so uh, what I want to uh, tell you first is just a quick run through of how the talk is organized. Uh, we'll be first talking about what it means to be doing science. Uh, then I'll tell you a little bit about the formal structure of science, uh, especially in the context of India. And uh, in the third half, or in the third part of this talk, I'll tell you about what are the new and exciting things that are happening in science. And finally, I'll give you a very brief glimpse of what are the things one could do if one were to choose a path that leads to one becoming a scientist. So I hope all of you are ready for the next 40 minutes. Uh, and I'll begin by a point that is very close to our heart these days. So let me ask you a very simple question. Can you move on to tomorrow without talking about COVID-19? I think the answer to this is no from every one of you. I don't think anybody can claim to be able to move on to tomorrow without talking about COVID-19. But now if you look back at how COVID-19 came around and how uh, and the kind of things that are being talked about in the context of COVID-19, you'll realize that there's a whole lot of things that are happening behind the scenes. Now, there's obviously the angle of virology, there's an angle of talking about the microbial world, about the tiny world, and about what might have led to this spread of this disease and so on. But you know, in the past, people didn't know about viruses, people didn't know about microbes, and uh, diseases were something which were uh, completely unexplained. They were, a, they were a danger that humans had to live with, and uh, nobody had an explanation of why anyone fell sick at any point of time, until uh, people discovered the world of microbes. Now, the world of microbes uh, if, was actually open to the human uh, to humans uh, by the work of a Dutch draper. Now, a draper is somebody who, work, who deals with cloth. And this person was curious as to how best to improve the quality of his fabrics. And he realized that in order to improve the quality of his fabrics, he needed to find out how to improve the thread that formed the fabric. In order to improve the quality of the thread, he needed to examine what the thread was or how the thread was, how it was structured, and so on, so that he could make improvements in it. In the process, he ended up discovering the microscope. Now, the discovery of the microscope has been one of the most important milestones in the progress of science. The, micro, uh, the microscope opened the world of microorganisms and everything at that scale to the human eye. Now, that really, is a very nice example of the spirit of science. A draper by no stretch of imagination today would be considered a scientist. But this draper took it upon himself to get to the bottom of the matter and took a lot of effort 
to find out means to get to what he wanted to achieve. And in the process, he ended up discovering the microscope and opening the world of microbes to us. Another example, I'm sure none of you can imagine a world without engines and vehicles, right? So an internal combustion engine is very much a part of our lives. It powers almost all vehicles and all aeroplanes that use and ships that you see in the world today. Now, the history of the engine is very interesting. And uh, if you try start tracing back the roots of this engine, we can come to one definite point. Of course, I mean, in history, there's always a wide range of age or wide range of period that is responsible for a certain development in science. But in this case, we can come to a one very definite point in 1798, when a German cannon borer actually put out the rationale behind or the reasoning behind why what makes things hot. So he did a lot of experiments, which I'm not going to tell you about. But the bottom line or the conclusion from his experiments was that the apparently indefinite heat that can be generated by friction could only be explained if heat were due to motion of some kind. So remember, please pay attention to these words. He says that it is due to motion of some kind and motion of some kind is described by some kind of dynamics. If you look at what Newton and people before that uh, used to explain the motion of bodies. So heat was again seen as something resulting from some similar motion. And that led to the development of the whole field of thermodynamics. And the field of thermodynamics is the basis of all heat engines. So the engines that we see today could be, and their history could be traced back to as far back as the 1700s or the 1800s. And at that point, the, the main work, the disseminal work in thermodynamics was done by people who were in today's world would not be called scientists. There were some professionals doing something, but again, something caught their fancy. They tried very hard to get to the bottom of what bothered them, and they discovered laws of nature. Can you imagine a life without synthetic chemicals today? So the whole of our life, starting from the toothpaste that we use in the morning, to the clothes we wear, to the devices we use, and so on are all based on the use of chemicals of a very wide variety all polymers are synthetic chemicals all paints are synthetic chemicals toothpaste is a synthetic chemical soap is a synthetic chemical whatever you like you name it you'll find that many of them are actually synthetic chemicals okay now the whole of chemistry uh, was is, a, is an experimental science brought largely an experimental science and in 1779 a french chemist who, uh, who actually drew the on the works of a nobleman and a theologian from the 1700s and 1750s and so on came to the discovery of this law of constant proportions what he found is that when chemical reactions occur uh, compounds combine in only certain definite proportions and this the law of definite proportions is one of the most significant foundational laws of chemistry it, it uh, strengthened the atomic view of, of matter. It told us how to control chemical processes uh, and so on. In all these examples that I've given you so far, I have not mentioned a single name. I've only mentioned some years and I have mentioned some achievements of our uh, ancestors. Now, there's a very good reason why I didn't mention the names. Because ultimately, when you look at the combined history of mankind, Individuals don't matter so much. What matters is what they discovered, and what matters is how they discovered it, what kind of effort went into it, what was the reasoning that went into it, and so on. It is very likely that if some of these laws were not discovered by the people who discovered them, somebody else would have discovered them eventually. And it is also likely that some of these laws could not have been discovered for a very long time and would have waited for one of you to discover it. So keep in mind, that the person is not so important. What is important is that you pursue a question, try to get to the answer with as much effort as you can put in and with dogged persistence. Okay? That is really the spirit of science. 
So very often we are faced with the question of what is the usefulness of science? Now, if you look at these three examples, and there are many other examples, it is hard to you know, accept a claim that these people were doing something that they knew would be useful to society. I'm pretty sure that they were not aware of any such use when they were doing this work. They were basically driven by a curiosity or by a hunger for what we call knowledge. But, you know, as things progressed, people realized that these inventions could be put to use. So their work did ultimately end up benefiting the society. Now, there are actually hundreds of such examples where people pursue an idea and they don't know when they're doing this, doing their work, whether it is going to be a useful idea or not, but they just pursue it because they are hungry for knowledge. Okay. But there are some people who also use whatever is available to them, whatever knowledge is, is available to them, in order to do something that will be directly beneficial to the society. So these are what we call practical applications. But remember that practical applications are not essential for the study of science. People have in the past studied science with the sole pursuit of knowledge, with the sole desire to get to the bottom of things, without worrying about how it is going to benefit society. Okay. So both approaches are perfectly fine. It is really a choice that the pursuer makes. If you are pursuing science, you could pursue science just for the sake of knowledge. You could pursue science for the goal of benefiting society. Both of them ultimately lead to improvement of human life, improvement of human knowledge. Okay, so how does one become a scientist? Now, you know, the general perception of a scientist is somebody who wears a lab coat, or somebody who works in a lab, and somebody who is generally absent-minded. Now, none of these things are really true. You could be a scientist without wearing a lab coat. You could be a scientist without having any fancy equipment to work with. What is important is that you learn what the principles of science are and you learn to use these principles, apply these principles to your daily life. And if you do that very carefully, if you do that fastidiously, you could be called a scientist. But I think the talk, this talk is not really so much about how to become a scientist in general or how to develop the scientific spirit, but I think it is more to do with how one becomes a professional scientist. So that is a slightly different game, and we'll talk about it in the second, second part of this talk. Okay, so some things are obvious. If you want to become a scientist, you must study science. Now that I think everybody understands and everybody knows, but I think a large number of people are unaware of a hidden challenge in this entire game. The hidden challenge is that humankind has created a vast body of knowledge and wisdom over the past so many centuries. The challenge for a student of science today is to somehow assimilate most of it in a short span of, I don't know, maybe five, 10, 15 years. But compressing centuries of knowledge, efforts of hundreds of people into a 15 year span or a 10 year span of one person is a formidable challenge. And I, I don't think anybody can really meet that challenge. So the pursuit of science is really a difficult task. It is by no means an easy task, but it is very interesting. It is challenging and it is a very enriching challenge, enriching uh, journey. Okay. Now, not everybody would want to do science formally. Okay, that's also very clear. Some people would like to be musicians. Some people would like to be cricket players. Some people might want to do some uh, theater or something else. Somebody might want to become an engineer. Somebody might want to become a doctor. Somebody might want to become an artist or a chartered accountant or something like that. So all these professions are have their own place. I'm not uh, making any such claims that you know science is holier than the rest or anything like that. Every profession has its place. So if you, if you don't like science, if you think that science is not for you, don't worry, that's perfectly all right. But if you like science and if you want to pursue science, make sure that you take the right 
route take the right steps now very often we are asked this question is engineering science or is medicine science now you'll see at the end of this talk that what the answer is i'll not give out the answer now uh, but remember that in the formal study of science uh, we are usually uh, we, we usually like to make some distinction between medicine and engineering which is okay uh, but you'll see that later that these distinctions are not uh, that clear okay. now the study of science is really a very long haul so let's say you are in high school today and you will finish your class 12 very soon and at that point you will be making a transition to one of these uh, one of these one of these disciplines so let's say you have decided to choose do science so the traditional route is that you go over to doing a bsc which is a three years uh, degree course then you go on to doing a msc which is a two years degree course and then if you are still interested in this and you want to pursue science as a career and you want to reach greater heights you aim to do a phd which could take any anything more than four years of typically five years or maybe six years so this entire journey from high school to becoming what is called a professional scientist is a fairly long journey and this journey as you can see is longer than most of the professions and there's a very good reason for that reason for which i have mentioned earlier and like in all of the fields uh, you know to be able to, to be able to be at the top you really have to be very very good and again whether you are a doctor or an engineer or an artist or a chartered accountant or a badminton player or a cricket player or whatever there can only be a very few people at the top the top is not for everyone and that's true of science also okay. and you know this given that this journey is very long if at some point of time let's say at the end of bsc you feel that no this is not my cup of tea uh, science is not for me don't feel dejected because you know every for every skill there is a whole lot of people with varying skills let's say you want to look at people who can sing now not everybody can be lata mangeshkar or kishor kumar some people have to be content with the fact that they cannot sing at all you take any other thing like say a cricket player not everybody can be a ms dhoni or a sachin tendulkar only some people can be like that the same is true of science the same is true of any other field so don't feel dejected you will certainly be good at something else if you are not good at science and if you discover this a little late in life don't be too disheartened about it you can always fight back okay so having chosen this path you will you will do a bachelor's degree for 3 years a master's degree for 2 years or in recent times there is this option of going in for a five year long integrated masters degree now all universities in india offer a bsc degree and these degrees are typically um, these degree courses are typically taught in colleges uh, the masters degree however is usually taught at the university not at the affiliated colleges there are some universities which are which have an exception to this but generally speaking the masters degree is at the university now there are some central universities uh, such as the hyderabad the university or the bhu and some some of these central universities offer integrated masters degrees uh, so do some of the iits or actually most of the iits okay uh, and uh, when you sign up for a integrated degree you are essentially committing 5 years of your time after your high school to pursuing a science degree so having made this choice of pursuing a degree in science what i would say is that a masters degree is something you should aim for you should not aim for just a bachelor's degree although the bachelor's degrees of a 3 years duration and the masters degrees of a 2 2 years duration the difference in the knowledge that you get the experience that you gain and the skill sets that you develop is very significantly different very significantly higher in the case of the masters degree so your goal should be to do a masters degree not just a bachelor's degree so i'll spend a minute or two about the iser system to which i belong uh, and i'm specifically uh, talk going to talk about this because this is a relatively new system in the indian scenario uh, isers were set up about a decade ago the oldest iser is uh, about 14 years old 
Uh, and there are seven ICERs now. The newest ICER is only three years old. Uh, ICERs were set up uh, with a very specific mandate. Unlike in the college university system, where the researchers are quite uh, you know, separated or compartmentalized from the students, in the ICER system, uh, research and teaching are combined. So the goal is to combine top class teaching and undergraduate research, uh, undergraduate teaching and top class research in under one roof. And because of this mandate and because of the environment uh, that uh, emerges from such a such a mandate, uh, students get a very significantly different experience compared to the university and college system. Uh, ICERs have uh, both undergraduate as well as uh, doctoral programs. And you could enter, enter an ICER uh, at one of the three stages. You could either enter it soon after class 12 for the integrated bachelor and master's degree, which is a five-year degree. You could enter an ICER after a BSc and join up for what is called the integrated master's and PhD program, where you get the master's and PhD degrees in one single commitment, or typically of about six years long. Finally, you could also complete your master's degree in a university and go to an ICER for a PhD. So we get students from all three streams. Uh, the largest chunk, of course, is the undergraduates, but these two are also very significant uh, numbers of students at the ICERs. That's all I'm going to say about the ICERs. If you have questions, you can ask them later. Okay. Now, I told you that uh, doing a master's degree is something that you should aim for uh, when, you, uh, when you decide on a career in science. Now, what does a master's degree entail? What does it give you? So usually it will give you a very good body of knowledge in the chosen field. So you could be, uh, let's say you have decided to be a, a physicist and you have chosen to do your master's in physics. So quite naturally, you would expect to gain a large body of knowledge in physics. But in addition to this, you will learn a few things irrespective of the chosen discipline. First of all, you will develop what is called a scientific temperament, which means to ask the right questions, to not accept answers unless there's a proof for what is being claimed, uh, and to, able, to be able to design an experiment or a logical set of questions in order to verify a claim and so on and so forth. You'll also learn a few other things like breaking down larger tasks into some smaller tasks so that you can address them as solvable units. So small problems which, to which you can find solutions. And this can be applied to a very diverse set of things, not just the immediate problem that is being asked to you at the end of a chapter in the book general problems not just in your lab or your in your chosen subject but also broader questions uh, concerning society concerning life and concerning variety of other things that happen around you so broadly speaking it will help you or it will train you to think logically it will train you to break larger problems down into smaller problems in addition not everybody but a lot of people will probably learn to connect apparently unconnected things and do what is called multitasking. And because of the kind of training that you get through a, uh, through a training in science or through an education in science is are these uh, variety of skills which could be useful to you, not just in your academics, but also in uh, non-academic pursuits. Okay, so this is very important. And this is something that a lot of people don't realize but these do come in very handy uh, eventually. Uh, it may not be obvious even to somebody who is just finishing his or her master's degree, but eventually you, you, you come back to it. You realize that, oh, this, this is something that I'd learned and this is how I am going to be able to use it now. Okay. So what after master's? I've been saying so far that you must aim to do a master's degree, but what after master's? Is that the end of your education? Is that, your, is that the end of your journey? As a scientist, no. I would in fact say that your journey as a scientist only begins once you have finished your master's. After the master's degree, if you really want to become a professional scientist, and this by this I mean traditionally this has meant actually uh, two kinds of occupations. One is uh, to teach 
and the, one, the second is to continue doing your research and one of the main uh, hurdles if you like or one of the main uh, goal posts in this journey is to get a PhD. Now PhD is a very hard uh, journey and as this cartoon says a PhD really is for those who don't or won't give up. Okay. Uh, I'm sure many of you are uh, aiming to go this way and i hope you do uh, but remember that this is a this is a long hard journey and not everyone is cut out to sustain this long journey and moreover not everybody is uh, really well suited to pursuing teaching or research as a long term career now this actually was the situation some years ago if you did a phd the only two things you could do or you would do was to teach in a college or teach at a university or do your research. Okay. But things are changing. Okay. Things are changing quite dramatically. And quite a large number of new opportunities have come up in the field of science. Okay. So the third part of my talk is going to be about these opportunities. Now, in order to lay the ground for this, these opportunities, let me just reiterate what I said a while ago. When you study a particular branch of science, you actually gain a lot of knowledge beyond that immediate domain of knowledge. You start seeing the complexity of things. You start seeing links between very complex phenomena. You start seeing links to things that you left behind. Okay. Once you reach that stage, you realize that the compartments that one has made in science physics, chemistry, biology, mathematics, or whatever else. These compartments are there for a purpose, for the purpose of learning one of these properly. Okay. But nature doesn't respect these distinctions. The distinctions have been made by humans for the convenience of teaching or pursuing a particular uh, line of inquiry. But ultimately what happens is when you start looking at very complex phenomena, you realize that these distinctions actually are no longer uh, meaningful and that's where the interdisciplinarity of science starts showing its true nature and this has actually uh, been recognized in the last few decades and there's a lot of effort now to combine expertise in different domains of science in order to solve real life problems Again, let us take the example, the current hot topic of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, if you start looking at the complexity of the situation we are faced with, I think you'll be easily convinced that it is not enough to simply know in great depth about viruses and physiology. If you know about viruses and if you know very, if you know physiology very well, uh, you will certainly be able to go a long way in the treatment of uh, COVID, COVID-19. But then you'll also realize that just these, just the knowledge of these two things is really woefully inadequate. You need to have a knowledge. When I say you, I, I'm not seeing one person in particular. I'm just talking about humanity in general. Okay. So we need to have a knowledge of chemistry because you need to find the right drugs. You need to know the chemical processes that will lead to the right drugs that will prevent you from wasting time on wrong leads. You need to know what kind of chemicals will be useful for sanitization, for safe sanitization without harming other things and so on. You need to know physics because you need to know how air flows, how these viruses might get transported, how does humidity affect the transport and so on and so forth. Statistics. You need to know statistics extremely well. Because you're trying to make predictions about spread. You're trying to see whether your containment strategies are working. And in all these uh, attempts, you are looking at numbers. You're looking at a whole lot of numbers and trying to make sense out of the numbers. So if you want to make sense out of these lot of numbers that are coming through, you need to have a very good knowledge of how to make predictions based on uh, data. You also need to know about economics because uh, the COVID-19 has thrown economy completely out of gear. We need to look at economics, 
ask the question whether lockdowns are appropriate, what are the fallouts, what are the benefits, and so on and so forth. Now, all these seem like completely unrelated fields. If somebody were to tell you that chemistry, physics, statistics, and economics are linked to each other, you would probably laugh at that suggestion. But here is a real life scenario where there's a disease, there's a pandemic, and all these allied topics or allied disciplines or allied subjects, if you like, have to be brought in. The expertise in these fields has to be put together in order to fight the pandemic. Another example, all of us are very fond of our mobile phones. And in today's uh, scenario, the importance of the internet, the importance of being connected, the importance of uh, online meetings, the importance of online teaching, and everything has shot up many, many fold. So building this better telecommunication network seems on the face of it like a purely an electronics engineering problem. But is it really purely an electronics engineering problem? Let us see. For a phone, you need a better battery because you want to talk for hours or stream videos for hours and so on. So you need better and better batteries as you're putting out more and more data. That's clearly a chemistry problem. You need better materials for your screen, for your keypad, for your casing, for the circuit boards and whatnot. So you need to find better and better materials. You, of course, need to know a lot of physics because all of the circuitry is based on solid state physics and electricity and magnetism, which I'm sure all of you are at least somewhat familiar with. These building blocks go a long way in developing circuits that form the heart of a, of a, uh, whatever, of a computer, of a cell phone, or whatever else. In order to establish this communication network, you need these towers. These towers had to be placed at the right position. You cannot put out a million towers. You can probably put out only a thousand due to cost reasons. So you need to find the right place to put the towers. You have to take into account weather. You have to take into account the terrain. You have to take into account buildings that will block the path of these uh, electromagnetic radiations. You need, so you need to know what the geography of, the, of that area is. You need to know whether there are water bodies, whether there are rocks, whether there are trees, whether there are buildings or whatnot in order to optimally place your towers. So what seemed like an electronics problem or an electronic engineering problem is in fact a problem that takes inputs or I mean, in order to be solved, it needs inputs from chemistry, from physics, from geology and whatnot. Okay. So I think I have indirectly answered the question about whether medicine is science and whether engineering is science. Okay, the previous example would have convinced you that medicine is part science and science is part medicine. Likewise, uh, engineering, again, in this case, electronics engineering is part engineering, part science, part physics, part chemistry. The point I'm trying to make is that the more and more complex our world gets, the more and more connections you start seeing between the traditional compartments of science, engineering, medicine, uh, and also the sub compartments of science, which are chemistry, physics, mathematics, biology, geology, whatever. Okay. So at the bottom of all this, is a lot of are a lot of connections between these artificial compartments of you, the body of human knowledge okay and these links are gradually being seen for what they are okay in the past when people were talking about physics they didn't talk about chemistry when they're talking about chemistry they were talking about biology and so on underlying all this of course is a lot of mathematics it is impossible to think of any process today which does not require mathematics, whether it be the share market or whether it is the spread of a disease. Okay. So where are we headed now? I've, I've told you about uh, the interdisciplinarity of science, which is a new emerging uh, theme. There's one more theme that is another very strong theme that is coming up. Traditionally, experiments have been the backbone of science. They have been the backbone of all developments in science. And theory has been very important in certain branches, certainly in physics, where it has really has a completely different and a separate and somewhat elevated standing. But the new paradigm that is emerging is that of modeling, simulation, and machine learning, which is entirely a fallout of the improvement in uh, our ability to do computations. And this has affected all branches of science. So I'm sure you have heard about the 
discovery of the gravity waves. Now, gravity waves were discovered very recently, three years ago, four years ago. Uh, but the prediction was made a long time ago. The fact that a gravity wave could or must exist or must be formed was predicted long, long ago. But in order to be able to detect this, one had to know what to expect, what kind of disturbance or what kind of signal to expect if one were to try and look for a gravity wave. And this was not easy or this was not easy to describe by merely looking at equations. A lot of simulations, which means computer-based numerical, uh, numerical analysis had to be done, which was, of course, based on the laws of gravitation, on the, based on the laws of general theory of relativity and so on. But the theory could only take you so far. Numerical simulations uh, were very important in predicting how the coalescence of two black holes would lead to gravity waves. These predictions were made based on numerical simulations and what was predicted was actually very close to what was detected in 2015. Without these numerical simulations, it would have been impossible to predict what kind of gravity wave signals to expect. Another example which keeps, uh, you know, which we keep coming across uh, almost every day is uh, from uh, predictions about weather. If you would have, if you have been paying close attention to how predictions about the monsoon have been changing in the last few years, you will realize that in the last four or five years, or maybe slightly more than that, predictions about the monsoon have been fairly accurate. And this was not the case 15 or 20 years ago. The reason for this is that we now have vast amounts of data and vast amounts of computing power, which are, which together is able to model the weather system in the Indian subcontinent, specifically the uh, northwestern, um, sorry, the southwestern uh, Indian monsoon, uh, fairly accurately and uh, predict, make very reasonable, very accurate pred predictions. So this is really based on a very, very complex set of inputs, which we, um, which I think a common man is simply unable to fathom. In order to get a picture like the one I've shown you on the screen, you need to be able to send out a satellite, a satellite that will hover over your region, take pictures, send them down, uh, you make sense out of it and put out these pretty pictures. So you need somebody who will build a rocket, you will need somebody who will build the satellite, you will need somebody who will build the instruments that go on a satellite. Make sure that they are launched properly, make sure that they work synchronously, work perfectly in very extreme environments that don't exist on the surface of the earth. Then you need somebody who will download the data, make sense out of it, and then put out these very pretty maps. Okay. But in addition to this, you also need people on the ground who will collect data, who will feed the data based on last year's monsoon or whatever, collect vast quantities of data, put it back into a, a set of computers that will process it, start looking for patterns and things like that. So all this is very computational intensive, but it also combines a lot of skills. It puts together a very large number of a very large kinds of skills. Okay, so they're really very complex inputs. These are things that are happening to science in the last decade or so. So the nature of science is actually changing. In the past, we had people who sort of were sitting in silos. They were experts in a branch of science like biology or chemistry or physics, who were not, I mean, who knew of course, knew some maps and knew some computer programming and things like that, but they were not really savvy in using computer computations, computational aspects. They were not savvy in statistics. There were statisticians who knew how to deal with real life data and predict trends, but they really didn't have enough data to work on based on real science. I mean, real science meaning science that is that was coming from uh, experiments being done by experts in that field and so on. Then you had mathematicians who were experts in pure maths and their problems, like many people say, had no real life connections, but this is not true. They have connections. It is just that these connections were, are not discovered very easily. Then there is this bunch of people who are computer experts, algorithm experts. They know how to solve certain problems. And this was like a happy scenario until about say 10 years or 20 years ago. What happened in the last 20 years or so is a very dramatic difference. What is emerging is this field of data science, which takes in inputs from all these domains. And the new scientist that I'm talking about is somebody who is going to be able to make a link between these. 
make a link between the traditional domains of science and the emerging ideas from computer science, emerging ideas from statistics, possibly from mathematics, and putting them together and creating new fields where you can use statistics to say identify patterns, make predictions based on inputs which are purely traditionally science. Use this data, put in algorithms to see whether you can discover something dramatic. Okay, so all these things are happening. Now, because these things are happening in a, in a big way, uh, we are really able to do a whole lot of things that were not possible earlier. Okay, so just, just a minute. So if you look at any domain in science now today, let's say neuroscience, cognitive sciences, particle physics, uh, weather, astrophysical modeling, uh, spread of disease, uh, spread of say diabetes or response to drugs for diabetes or general population trends related to economics, finance sector, anything that you name, it has it is of late using inputs from computer science. It is using principles of science, especially physics, uh, in order to model very complex natural systems or very complex man-made systems. So the, the number of such possibilities of using knowledge in science to other fields has improved very many fold. Okay. So in order, in addition to the research topics that I mentioned so far, you would have realized that while I was talking about these research topics, there are many peripheral areas where you need expertise in science in order to do well. Okay. So these may not really count as frontline research, but you need people trained in that domain. Uh, these might be non-academic pursuits. They may be in the industry. They may be in the banking sector. They may be in uh, in, the, in social studies, in medicine, and so on, which require people who are trained in science and who can make uh, very well trained judgments. Okay. So the the point I made just a while ago about large volumes of data. Okay. Who collects this data? Can you leave this data collection to an untrained person? No, you can't. Because you need to be able to show that the data quality is good, the data is reliable, and so on. How does one know whether the data is reliable? Unless you are able to judge the background science behind what has created that data, you will not be able to make a proper judgment. So the need for well-trained scientists is increasing day by day in a vast variety of fields. I'm not saying that they are they are in demand in great numbers, but they are in demand in a vast variety of fields. Besides, of course, academia, which we have talked about. So what are these areas? Okay, so we'll quickly wrap up. We are nearly at the end of our uh, session. Uh, I'll just wrap up by saying what are the other areas that are that are now looking at people who are trained in science. So in physics, you, of course, because of the nature of the subject, both in physics and chemistry, you learn to use sophisticated instruments. If that is what you like, you could use your knowledge of physics to pursue a career in that kind of a field. You can develop new instruments. Again, drawing on your training in physics, your training in chemistry, or some other area, you could develop better and better instruments that use all the modern developments. There's this whole field of data analytics where you use data from different fields, you acquire data from different fields, use your knowledge in physics or mathematics to model these processes, make predictions, make wise business decisions for somebody, okay, for a company, let's say. Chemistry, of course, there is the traditional pharmaceuticals, petrochemicals, forensics is a new upcoming branch. And virtually all consumer products, like I said at the beginning, starting your day with a toothpaste or a soap to virtually every device that you use requires chemical or synthetic chemicals. Uh, you, there's a vast market uh, for careers out there. There's toxicology, there is environmental engineering, which are two very important branches coming up uh, as the human influence on nature keeps on becoming stronger and stronger and we are uh, you know, faced with very often situations where human activity is degrading the natural habitats. Then there is biology, where biotechnology is a new, uh, is not, not new, but it is a very strong emerging field. Uh, there's the bio-agri sector, because as you know, uh, there are concerns about uh, 
how we are going to be able to feed our people as the population grows, how we are going to preserve our soil as we start, as we have used chemical fertilizers for decades together. So there is a whole lot of new thinking that is happening in the field of biology, especially related to agriculture, which is a very challenging and an emerging field. There are, of course, medical devices, drug design, bioengineering, which are all related to the medical uh, stream. Uh, there's also this field of cognitive sciences, which again is a new field. Mathematicians and statisticians, although would typically not be categorized as scientists, they also stand to gain in this new era where mathematics, statistics, and computer science are all coming together to in various fields, starting from finance all the way to designing uh, an aeroplane or designing fluid flows or uh, whatever else, which are very, very complicated things to uh, do analytically. Uh, there is a question of data security, cryptography, and all kinds of algorithms to do data compression, which are which require pure math inputs. <clears throat> so there is indeed a very large variety of things that today's new scientists could do. And common to all of them is really a very different set of things. Uh, you could be a science entrepreneur if you have the business skills. You could be a science manager or an administrator with large science operations happening. We need people who will manage uh, science policies, who will manage science funds, who will manage intellectual property that arises out of scientific research. You could, of course, be selling or marketing research equipment. And last but not the least, you could be uh, pursuing something like science writing, science media, science journalism. The last one is actually very, very important because as the society moves from being a scientifically minded, uh, sorry, uh, a traditional society to a scientifically minded society. It is important that we put out accurate reports, make right, uh, you know, right projections about science, uh, report things correctly, and uh, you know, prevent people from believing wrong things. That is where uh, a very important role can be played by a trained scientist. In order to promote science careers, especially at the level of class 12 or so, the government has put out various schemes, two of which I have mentioned here. Uh, one is the Kishore Vaigyanik Protsan Yojana, which is meant for students of class 11th and 12th. And there is the Inspire scheme, which is again a DST, Department of Science and Technology scheme, uh, which is not just for class 12 students, but also for students who are pursuing science at the BSc level and the masters and the PhD levels. So a variety of schemes exist for promotion of science uh, and you should look up the respective websites to get more information. Uh, I have nearly come to the end of my talk. I'll just summarize by saying that science is becoming more and more challenging. It is becoming more and more interdisciplinary and it is attempting to tackle complex systems by cross fertilization of ideas from a variety of domains. So in addition to the traditional uh, traditional pursuits of research for the sake of doing research, meaning for the pursuit of knowledge or teaching, which are the traditional areas, which are of course very important. It is important that we have good teachers. It is important that we have good researchers, but there are also a new set of areas where the new scientists, which is the bunch of you who are listening to this webinar, have very many opportunities and far more challenges than what the old scientists had. So good luck to you and hope that many of you join and pursue science and enrich science in the decades to come. Thank you very much. Uh, questions uh, that have been posted on uh, posted live will now be addressed by uh, Dr. Saurabh Dubey, my colleague, and I'll switch, uh, I'll ask him to switch over to the live stream and I'll go off these slides. Over to you, Saurabh. Okay, good Good evening, everyone. Um, so thank you, Bas. That was, you know, a lot of fun for me to sit through as well. I have been trying to look at the questions that people have posted. Um, there aren't that many. So as, as uh, Bas already mentioned that this isn't a recipe for how to do science. The idea was to give you a flavor for what a science education will teach you. And at some level, the, the, there is a myriad of different professions that can that you can pursue after that. A lot of it will depend on what exactly you yourself like, 
what sort of skills you happen to discover that you're good at as you're doing your science education. One question that comes up quite a bit has to do with how do you apply to different universities? How do you apply to different projects? Um, what sort of other things you should do? So one of the things is typically in a scientific career, it is very difficult to anticipate what is going to happen to you, say, five years down the line. This means that if you're doing your 12th standard right now, uh, you should be really worried about what is a good place to get a bachelor's degree uh, or maybe think about a bachelor's plus master's degree. This isn't really the time to be thinking about how I should go about doing PhD applications. The reason for this is as you start your bachelor's degree or as you start your master's degree, there is a lot of training that you get that is on the job. You will start to talk to your peers. You will start to talk to your seniors. And surprisingly, you will start to talk to a lot of your professors as well. As you start to work with somebody or work in a field, work in somebody's lab, naturally you start to you know, read the research papers of that area. You start to figure out you know, what conferences people go to. During this time, you yourself learn that, okay, what are the leading places around the world where research is being done? Who are the people? No matter what institute you're at, there are always seminars happening. So there will be visitors from India, from abroad who are visiting there. You will get a chance to talk to them. So what happens is during your degree, you will tend to mature and you will know what is the right thing to look for in different, different universities. So if you're going to apply for a project, what should you look for? Should you, how should you decide that is this a vibrant place? Uh, is this place doing a lot of cutting edge science? Does this place have an instrument that I would like to learn how to use? And so these things are stuff that you cannot actually predict way beforehand. This happens naturally as you, you know, enter your stream and do things. There are a couple of more questions. Um, maybe this is a question that I would like Bhas to sort of uh, uh, take. So Bhas, for example, a question is asked is, what is the difference between an MS and an MSc degree? Okay. So uh, in the Indian system, the, traditionally the master's degree has been an MSc degree, Master of Science. The US system has a similar degree, which is called MS, but there's a slight difference in that the US system expects you to do uh, 16 years of schooling or what they call schooling, what we would call college education, a total of 16 years before you can enter the master's uh, degree program. The MS degrees that the ISAs offer, for instance, are uh, have a slightly different way of getting to that stage because of the uh, because the mandate of the ISOs is very different and they have a different structure of their courses compared to the usual university. So in order to distinguish between the master's degree that the ISOs give and what is traditionally given by the universities, uh, the distinction is made as the ISOs degree are called, ISO degrees are called MS, whereas the university degrees are called MSc. But in terms of the number of years it takes after the after class 12, the duration is the same in uh, the ISAs as well as the uh, universities, uh, but the emphasis is different. The structure of the courses is different and so on. Thank you, Bas. So we also have a, a bunch of questions that have that are kind of targeted. So, for example, mm -hmm. in the chat box, there are questions about um, how can you know if you if you do an MSc in astronomy, what happens after that? We have questions about what is the scope for doing, say, astrobiology. Um, these things are not, there are no specific answers to this. So for example, if you do an MSc in astronomy, there are various things that you could actually end up doing as you're doing your uh, MSc. For example, you could perhaps work with somebody in trying to uh, build an instrument that is going to go on a satellite. This means that you could be designing the electronics for it. Or you could be somebody who's say going to write down the software for how a telescope tracks stars in the sky. Right. So maybe you will write some some program for this. Because of this, during what you do in your MSc, the skills are quite different. The traditional route is always available to you. You do an MSc in astronomy, then do a PhD in astronomy. But suppose you don't want to do that. The skills that you have learned in writing this software for large instruments, you could put to use, say, in a, you know, automation factory, say a car factory where you want to automate how vehicles are produced. Should I first produce all red vehicles or should I produce red and yellow and red and yellow? Should I make all automatic vehicles first or do gears and then automatic and so on? So this is the sort of training that you get during an MSc. 
and then how you decide to apply it really depends on what you want to pursue at the point when you finish your MSc. Yeah, Bhas. Yeah. So I, I would like to add something to what Saurav just said. I made a point uh, sometime during the talk that you learn to seek connections. So here is an example where you will start seeing connections. I'll just give you a very simple example. Some of you might know of what a bandwidth means. Maybe the term bandwidth has come up very frequently in the recent times. People don't have enough bandwidth. People don't have enough bandwidth. What they really mean is that not so much data can be streamed from one through one connection because a lot of connections are using the same uh, same route to lead to whatever you are trying to uh, download. Let's say the YouTube uh, video that you are currently seeing. Now this bandwidth is a, such a funny thing. You the same thing appears in different guises in different fields. Okay. For a musician, a bandwidth means something else. But the underlying principle is still, still the same. The term bandwidth uh, in an oscilloscope, which is an instrument for looking at electronic devices, is something else. But you, once you are trained as a certain kind of scientist, you start seeing connections which others won't. The example that Saurabh gave is about software being used for something else. But now if that software is used like a dumb box, you will not be able to use this software for purposes that it was not originally intended for. But if you are smart and if you are able to see the connections, you will be able to adapt this software for a lot of other things. So one example is about is the way face recognition is done. Face recognition is about discovering patterns, discovering networks and so on. All these come from a very different branch of say computer science. They come from uh, a branch of mathematics, but they are ultimately used for figuring out whether the person using the phone is the correct person or not. How do you sir? Okay, so so in the in the spreadsheet there is one question that I think both of us should should you know very mm -hmm. very unequivocally sort of answer. The question asks which science stream is suitable for girls. Okay. So, so the answer is every single one. Surely. Every single science stream is suitable for girls. There is absolutely nothing that you can't put your head to and do. So. We, we absolutely need to be utilizing all 100% of humanity. There's no, no sense in uh, the asymmetry that we see. I understand that sometimes challenges may be different in trying to get to the same place. And of course, this is true. But that is the idea. We want to face these challenges and fix it. Okay. Sure. I mean, there's, no, there's absolutely no doubt about this. Now, he, here is a question that, that is uh, also very interesting that both of us would like to say. Can a teacher, along with their teaching, be a good researcher? So, so maybe I'll let Bhas start off on this. Sure. So uh, I think somewhere, somewhere in my talk, I mentioned that teaching and research are two traditional streams. Uh, and these uh, used to be considered quite separate. But that's no longer the case today because of the variety of things that are possible today. A teacher can also be a researcher. Now, there are some places, uh, especially the universities and places like ISERS, where teaching and research are not separable they both are integral part of a faculty member's job okay but of course i understand that this question may not be necessarily meant for those who are aiming to become faculty members at a university you might perhaps be asking this question in the context of a school science teacher or a college science teacher now again there because of the way you are able to communicate much better in today's age compared to say 10 years ago and because of the larger number of opportunities that are av available uh, it is certainly possible to do a small amount of research while you're doing your teaching. Please don't think of these as two compartmentalized pursuits. Okay? They are related because you're using the knowledge in one uh, to the benefit of the other and vice versa. What you do by way of teaching helps you in your research and what you gain through your research feeds back into your teaching. So both Saurabh and I, we teach as well as do research. And I'm sure Saurabh will agree with me in, in saying that when we teach in the class, there are occasions where you realize that, oh, this is what I was doing when I was doing designing a certain experiment or when I was analyzing a certain bit of data. And that stays in your head and that shows up in your teaching by way of an example, which students appreciate very heartily. So the connections are, uh, are there. It is for you to discover these connections and uh, be assured that these connections are not hard to come by. It is just that you have to put your mind to it. Opportunities are there. Uh, 
connections are there you just have to discover them yeah i i agree completely okay so uh, there is a class of questions that talks about um i mean so, so there are specifics about doing either computer science or computational biology and so on mm -hmm. uh, broadly the question is how does one equip oneself to become a good researcher yeah. uh, a different follow up question to this has been asked in the context of physics specifically that what sort of research is involved in experimental physics versus theoretical physics what are the best institutes for these kind of research so in terms of how to become an eminent researcher this is something that there is no recipe for some broad traits maybe i'll mention a couple and bhas can mention a couple so for example i would say one good trait that all researchers should have is to have an open mind for example um, you know there is no such thing as compartmentalizing yourself into saying i am a biologist so i am not going to take an interest in chemistry or or i am a experimentally so i'm not going to take interest in theory no you remain open you try to absorb and learn as many different things as possible um maybe something else is the ability to take uh, to to do hard work uh, a lot of science and a lot of progress in science is is very difficult um, it, it's you know the trouble is that it, typically we see examples of people who have made grand discoveries but we we don't see the examples of the day to day struggle that even the grand discoveries require so you know in your life you may make one big discovery if you're very very fortunate most of the times every day is spent doing a lot of hard work without necessarily seeing immediate returns on that so that ability to be able to push through and do a lot of hard work is sometimes important to to do research so yeah so i completely agree perseverance is one of the most uh, important prerequisites okay if you cannot persevere you cannot survive a science career that is very very clear but what is also important is uh, to be able to detach yourself and think from a third perspective okay so there's a very famous quote i i i, I sort of remember who it is from but doesn't as i said persons don't matter the thought matters so this person said that to be able to see things clearly it often helps to change your own point of view so this is very true of science you might be deep in the middle of something pursuing your own ideas and you might just be completely lost in thinking only along one line you should take a few large steps backwards and look at what you are doing from a very dispassionate view you will realize that oh maybe you are wrong somewhere to be able to look at yourself and see that you you could be wrong is also a very important uh, ability or a very important skill in the pursuit of science okay so so then there is also the question of what makes uh, good institutes for say pursuing science or something mm -hmm. see uh, there is no such thing as an institute is better than another institute because a lot of science is not done at the institutional level but it is done by individuals and individual groups now because this is done at an individual level it is also not clear that you know at one point in time person a is doing good and at some point in time person b is doing good they may be in different institutes so you have to be very careful about uh, you know looking up necessarily things like rankings to be able to tell what is good for you individually what you can do look for is look for broad sweeps in general so you want to go to institutes that are say vibrant vibrant in the sense of they have say a diverse faculty uh, at at an institute perhaps a lot of different things are being pursued at the same time there is a fair amount of say chemistry also and biology also and physics also you also want to prefer maybe institutes that have fair bit of theory and experiment because there should be cross talk you may prefer institutes which have good visitor program so that means that there's lots of people coming and giving talks and and so on um these are some of the broad things that you would look at before you you would pick institutes even after that it's still kind of hard to necessarily say that you know an institute is is better per se because individual experiences are going to be varying across these so so it's really difficult to say what I'll give a recipe for this is the best institute it really doesn't work that way okay um then there are some other questions about uh, uh, so this question is particularly about what should a second year bsc student do who wants to pursue physics 
but maybe bas i would like to answer it differently like what are the sort of things that say 12 standard people should do what are the kind of things maybe end of bsc people should do and so on so what do you say about uh, let, let's start with the high end maybe let's start with what should a msc level student do right so uh, i think a msc level student first needs to ask himself or herself the question am i ready for a long haul that's the first thing because it is a very serious commitment on time uh, uh, i am talking of a phd uh, degree that is a very serious commitment on time and uh, it uh, essentially means that you will be pursuing one thing doggedly for the next 5 6 years to the exclusion of practically everything else i mean i'm not saying that you will never be able to play football or whatever but uh, by and large that is what uh, it means so you have to ask yourself the question whether you are ready for this and if you are ready for that then take the next step which is to find a good place like sort of said find the right place for you not not good in, in the sense of the best rank place but the place that suits you the best the suits your interest the best find such a place get into their phd program via an interview and uh, an exam like jam or jgbills or jest or whatever uh, appropriate for the subject uh, and uh, and qualify for the interview that is the first step now uh, as i said as you go to the top the room becomes smaller and smaller so for every 100 students doing msc it is possible that only 5 of them end up doing a phd just make sure that you are good, good enough to be among the, those 5 okay so it is a, it is a hard battle i mean I, let us not make any presumptions about it being easy it is a hard route it is not a route for everyone so be very careful in making this pick but having made this pick put in your best in order to do well in the exam and in the interview okay and i think once you cross that barrier and once you enter a place which is of your own choosing and you are driven enough to be doing this then it is really a matter of how disciplined you are in terms of pursuing your goal it is then no longer a question of being able to appear for an exam and so on you are, it's it's largely largely your own doing whatever you do whether you fail or succeed is mostly your doing you have to be determined enough to last through those hard five years okay okay uh, so at the at the bsc level i think the answer is is slightly easier it's kind of like after 10th you have to decide whether you want to do science arts or commerce in the same way at the end of the bsc you, you should have a fairly good idea of if you are interested in science enough to make a career out of it in which case the obvious next step for you is to do an msc um if you at the end of your bsc have a feeling that no i i studied science i've learned a lot of things but i i need not want to make a career at it this is the the, the time then to start to a first make a list of the skills that you already have and to then enroll in things that are going to give you skills that will make you employable so these can be very very varied depending on what your interests are at the end of a bsc if you like for example media or writing you can enter into science writing or even other sort of journalism if you like uh, computation for example you can do dedicated computer science courses or data science courses to to get employability there so the the basic thing is that at the end of a bsc you should choose whether you you want to pursue a career in science in which case you should be worried about how you will get into a good msc program and what are the steps you can take to ensure that you get into a good program or the other side now what should you do at the end of a 12th standard pass what what is the right steps to take <laughs> so at the end of the 12th standard you are actually faced with a real question yeah what are you going to do in life that's what everybody wants to ask you and uh, very often you are not prepared to answer this question and which is which is okay because you are only 17 or 18 years old and uh, you may not really know what you want to do which is fine uh, but if you if you want to do science which i think is what most of the audience here uh, or not most but a large fraction of the audience is probably hoping to do uh, you should make sure that you go to a a serious college okay or a place like an icer to do your bachelor's and masters uh, because uh, unfortunately it is the case that a large number of our bsc students uh, are doing that because they don't know what else to do that is really the situation in in many many places so just make sure that you go to a, a robust degree program a college where uh, a degree is seriously pursued it doesn't matter where it is okay because ultimately it really is a question of how driven you yourself are 
if you are driven every college will have a few teachers who will encourage you to do it this is true of every college i mean there's there's just no no exception to that i mean even in isr okay uh, there'll be some student some teachers who will help you with uh, in pursuing your your goal they'll help you build your abilities in such a manner as to take the next challenge which is if you want to do a phd it will be like msc phd and so on read a lot make sure that you are not bogged down by your textbooks make sure that you read widely be well informed uh, pursue hobbies which are related to the subject like do some experiments try to take part in some science fairs try to take part in competitions yes so that you uh, you remain abreast of what are the what things are happening around you okay don't get cooped up in a corner pursuing just one degree reading one book that's that's not the goal the goal should be to read as widely as possible uh, do as many related things as you can and it doesn't matter whether you are in a small town or a, or a city these things are still valid okay and if you if you do that and come through with it with your enthusiasm intact enthusiasm growing i'm sure you can pursue a career in science for those who don't want to do science of course there are many other opportunities you could do arts commerce you could do engineering you could do management you could just do computer programming and grow in that direction in that field uh, or you could uh, pursue something something completely different like you know i mean there are there are people who do all kinds of all kinds of things design architecture uh pursue arts uh, and there are many many small things like i said you know in in science there are many things that have that have emerged in the last 10 15 years in the last 10 15 years there are changes in the other fields also so there are many opportunities which are not as well uh, say recognized or documented as the standard streams of engineering medicine and science which are there it is just for you to find out whether they suit you and whether you would like to pursue them okay so th- there is a set of questions that a- at face seem unrelated but i would want to connect them and ask them all all together mm-hmm. so, uh, so one question talks about if you want to be an engineer then must you do biology in high school uh, okay. a separate question asks that is it necessary to study computer science in high school to be an astronomer and the third question says that are there any career scopes for uh, doing science in sanskrit now uh, i'll let bhas also answer this but i i'll say this that you have to think the other way around so in some sense think of it as if you learn something then you will be able to apply it so rather than ask the question that is there a scope for this the question is opposite if you happen to have a skill so if there happens to be a person who knows biology and mechanical engineering then this person can design prosthetics on the other hand if there happens to be a person who knows biology and i don't know like chemical engineering then such a person may be able to do drug design or something if a person knows science in sanskrit then i'm sure you could do like you know some sort of a outreach show or you could try to figure out if as they say if sanskrit really is the best language to be doing coding in and so on so depending on what your skills are you will figure out how to apply them so it doesn't really make sense to ask should i do this to do that it's rather whatever skills you accrue through your life you will then use all of those skills to try to answer some question so i i i agree with what saurabh said but i would also like to add one more point to this uh, you will find that superficial knowledge in different areas is not very useful Okay, so when when you say that you know would learning computer science in school help me do astronomy the kind of computer science you would learn in school is really very meager right now whether that is going to help you write a code for an for tracking a telescope or something like that uh, i think the answer is best left unsaid so when you are talking of bridging two seemingly different fields or seemingly different domains of knowledge please understand that unless you have sufficient depth of knowledge in both fields it is very hard to see connections or it is very hard to make use of one into the other okay so please don't treat this as as trivial issue they are deep issues 
and it is very hard to expect that uh, that somebody who has studied one subject as computer programming or computer science in class 12 will necessarily be able to use it as it is later on it might be useful in a very small way but it is not a make or break situation if you don't study computer science in your class 12 it doesn't prevent you from being an astronomer exactly exactly okay? so don't 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 get carried away by that idea that if you start learning very early on i mean if if you were to stretch that logic a bit then people who became engineers should have become you know started thinking about engineering from the age of 6 months you can always learn a skill later but if you have learned if you have learned the skill of learning a skill right. you can learn a new skill at any point in life right please please understand that but it is important to learn skills very very well it is only then that you will be able to use them uh, across fields i i think this the ibhas touched on a very important thing here that th there there may sometimes be a rush to try to uh, learn stuff that you think is going to be useful later this is what we meant that at, at the 12th standard level you should not be worried whether you are going to become an astronomer or not if you want to become an astronomer you you will have to learn a lot of physics beforehand for example or a lot of maths beforehand sure. what you should worry about is how are you doing that to the best of your ability rather than worry about stuff that is only going to come in much much exactly. later exactly so i mean there's a bunch of other questions maybe this is the last question that we can take bhas uh, yes yes this is interesting the question is when should we give the the best industrial training to faculties who are teaching students who will build the next generation of the world so so what sort of industrial training should teachers have or people who want to get into teaching what sort of hands on skills maybe they should have and at what point should they learn these skills sir can you repeat did you say industrial training yes yes industrial training to to faculties at some level but it also means to students as well to at at what point and how much should people okay. so i i i think this question needs to be interpreted a bit i mean the direct meaning is is quite different from what the implied meaning might be in my in my way of thinking so i i would i would just rephrase the question a bit and uh, ask what kind of practical training should teachers and students be receiving right. in order to say you know pursue something later in life okay so having rephrased the question like this uh, i'll try to answer it uh so some some disciplines or some subjects are inherently more experiment centric like chemistry or biology and and in in the pursuit of biology or chemistry uh, you need to worry less about theory than about your hands on skills let's say okay now say if you want to produce a milligram of aspirin you might and that is your only goal then you know you might hunt 100 books find uh, some method to do it and ultimately get your 1 gram of 1 milligram of aspirin but if you were to want to scale this process and produce 100 tons of aspirin which is what the country needs then of course you need to worry about a whole lot of other things which is whether the process is industrially viable whether the process is economically viable whether the raw material is abundant in supply whether it is uh, whether a steady supply of raw material can be ensured and so on so forth there will be hundreds of other questions so these are two completely different skills now it is very difficult to foresee a situation where a teacher is also an expert in the process of making aspirin on an industrial scale but what is important is that the teacher be aware of this other dimension and that i think comes largely from the background training of the teacher and it is not something that can be imparted to a teacher on the job this is something that the teacher needs to learn on his or her own by keeping his or her avenues uh, and eyes and ears open to a variety of things now the same question applied to students again it's a question of what the student wants to do in the future if uh, the student wants to say use that chemistry training in order to serve the industry then of course the student has to make that effort to learn these additional things see 
I, I, I made a point about the challenge of science education or science training being that of cramming several centuries of wisdom and several hundreds of people's efforts into a very short time span. So if you want to learn industrial chemistry or if you want to learn about industrial processes, uh, in addition to the basic principles of chemistry in say one semester, that's clearly not going to work for everyone. Specifically, if a certain person is interested, he or she should will have to make that effort to learn that extra bit and seek guidance wherever possible. Okay, so I don't think a one formula applies to all kind of situation exists in any of these disciplines, not just the example that I took, but in, in everything. So these are, these are, if I may say, these are extra pursuits, I mean, extracurricular pursuits. Okay, I think, I think, Bhas, that is more or less uh, the kind of, you know, broad, broad swathe of questions that we have. Sure. Um, sure. I, I think we should say goodbye to our viewers now. I invite you to make some final remarks about careers in science. Okay. So I hope that uh, you found the last, well, it's been a long time, an hour and 20 minutes uh, useful and hopefully also somewhat enjoyable. Uh, we have tried to answer some of the questions and uh, I again hope that these questions will help you in, uh, in, you know, in a, developing a new take on science careers because we have touched upon some fascinating developments in the in different disciplines of science and the interdisciplinarity of it, the use of data science or computational aspects which are new to science and are really changing the scene of science research very significantly. We also told you about uh, new careers that are developing because of these challenging developments. And uh, in the question answer session, we tried to answer some of your questions, perhaps not all, uh, but I'm sure we, we gave you a slightly different perspective on what uh, an education or a pursuit of a science degree means in the Indian context and who it is for, who it is not for, and uh, what you should by and large be doing in order to pursue science. Hope you enjoyed it and we'll maybe meet some other time. Thank you all. Bye-bye.